long time, I, you know, obviously because I didn't see anyone who looked like me working in TV news, um, I thought there was a moment where I thought, you know, maybe I'll go into radio because then it doesn't matter what I look like, you know? Yeah. Um, but my mom, again, was the one who kind of encouraged me, like, don't change your dreams, don't change your goals. Um, you know, this is something that obviously you're really good at, you were made for. Um, so go for it, right? And, and just because it hasn't been done before doesn't mean you can't be the first. Yeah, people always tell me I have a face for radio and I'm starting to believe them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the episode. I know you said you were in your living room. I'm in my bedroom. So I feel like it's very easy going, very comfy. We're not in like a bar or a pub where it's like, hey, it's like, can you, can you not? We're trying to listen to the music over here. Um, <laughs> I, first thing I want to really ask you is like, how excited were you to get your program on CBC? Because I feel like I, I've gone through a little bit of your career, but I don't want to go too much into it because I tell people when they're on this, this is your time. Um, but tell me like how exciting that is to get your platform basically on CBC. It was unbelievable. I was like holding back tears on the phone when they, when I got the call that I got the job and it was just so exciting um, to be, you know, to move from a local news station to a national platform, um, you know, was really surreal. It still is <laughs> sometimes when I'm like, you know, scrolling through an article on CBC and suddenly there's like an ad with my face on it and my name. Uh, yeah. It's still kind of weird. And, you know, I think even for my family, I remember um, when I got hired, we were still kind of uh, developing the show. So it didn't have a name yet. And we were talking about what the name was going to be. And I kind of floated, you know, we'd floated some ideas and I was talking to my mom on the phone and I said, you know, we're trying to figure out a name. And there was some talk about calling it like Janella Massa Live or Janella Massa Tonight. And my mom was like, wait a second, it's your show? <laughs> Yeah. I said, yes, mom. Like I, I, I've been hired for like a month or I'm like, I explained this to you. She's like, it didn't really compute to her. Like it, she, it didn't make sense to her. She didn't realize she just thought I'd been hired at the CBC and I was going to anchor a show or, you know, and I was maybe part of a team of a newscast. She didn't realize like it was just me. <laughs> so that yeah. was kind of a, a, a funny moment. She like comes back to you. It's like, okay, I, I know, I know you're happy you're hired, but like, listen, they're not giving you your own show yet. And then you're like, no, actually, they are. And then you're just sort of like, yeah. she's like, she's like, hold on, I, I just gotta take a five minutes break. Yeah, yeah. totally. I, I think it's funny because yeah, I was gonna mention to you like, you know, we had Strombo had his own show for a while that was called The Hour, and then they, I think it was called uh, George Stropolopoulos Tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually got that out. Her, that that the whole sentence. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, I wait, I was waiting for me to mess up on that. But yeah, it's interesting because I guess. I kind of like the title just because we're you have Canada tonight and like this is me. I, I know we both have communication degrees. Uh, I have mine from Carlton, uh, but <laughs> uh, this is me kind of going into a little bit dissecting into it because if you just called it like your your own show, like your your name and that's it, I'd be like, OK, like what I is get, it? Yeah, yeah. Like it's still that's like, how I felt. Yeah, like, I was opposed. I was opposed yeah. to having it having it be named after me, especially because I thought well, people in Canada don't really know me. I'm not a household name. Like, what is this going to mean to them, right? Yeah. And the show is not about me, right? I want it to be a window into Canada. So yeah. I had I had other suggestions. My I wanted it to be called. Um, uh, can what did I? What was my suggestion? I think it was Canada Connected. Um, okay. But there used to be a show on CBC called Connect with Mark Kelly. So that was kind of vetoed because they didn't want to repeat a, a, a yeah. similar title. Um, and so the suggest, I actually wasn't a huge fan of the, the title when it first was presented to me, Canada Tonight. Um, I thought it sounded too much like a newscast and we really wanted to do more in-depth conversations. Um, but then, um, one of the, um, senior producer said, well, what I like about it is, you know, this is what we're talking about in Canada Tonight, or this is what's happening in Canada Tonight. And that kind of made me go, I like that. <laughs> and so I was sold. And that is what we use as our intro every night when we do our headlines this is what we're talking about in Canada tonight. Um, I like, I that like resonated that. with me. I like that. But I, the way that I was looking at it is kind of more as inclusive is it's almost like, okay, we have, so we're talking about Canada, like tonight, again, tonight in Canada, but with you as a host, it's like, look at, look at where we're going in Canada or look at like, it's like the melting pot of like, Hey, like for me, myself, I'm a person with disability. Now it's, a very invisible disability. But if someone like, for example, I hope the day comes where CBC, CTV or something hire someone with a disability, I'm like, all right. And if it's called, you know, it's just say Canada AM or whatever, 
you're like, oh, okay. Like now I can see someone like myself on TV and be like, okay, it's not just me on TV of like, this is me and my disability. Let's talk about it. It's like, I'm included in this whole bigger world. Um, Absolutely. Like when I want to ask you too, like, how did you get interested in journalism? Because, you know, we all idolize someone to get into a certain field. Like me, I like comedy. I loved Conan. I loved like watching Colin Mockery on Who's Line. Uh, podcasting me was like almost a way of getting your humor, but doing interviews because I liked interviews. But I had someone to look up to. Who was someone that like you looked up to and said, I want to be a broadcaster? <laughs> well, I was that kid who was always chatting, always talking, always wanting to be the center of attention <laughs> a little too much. <laughs> that was like the number one uh, comment on my report card was like, Janelle is a good student, but she talks too much in class <laughs> when she's not supposed to. Um, so I was always kind of that energetic, you know, kid. And, and I think my parents knew that like, oh, she's going to do something in the spotlight. She's going to do something, you know, on TV. And my mom would kind of encourage me like, oh, you should host a show. And I thought I was going to do something more like lifestyle. I did it was, I wasn't necessarily interested in like news or politics. I thought I was going to, you know, host a daytime show or a lifetime, a, a lifestyle kind of show. Um, and I, I studied broadcast journalism and, and I had my internship at uh, CTV Toronto and I kind of, you know, would see the inner workings of the newsroom and see, you know, these reporters rushing to get their deadline and realizing that like news um, is just storytelling. Okay. Um, and, you know, everyone has a story if we just ask. Uh, and I thought that was really cool being able to, you know, um, be the vehicle to take something, a piece of information and turn it into something interesting that people want to watch and hear. And so, yeah. So, I mean, for a long time, I, you know, obviously because I didn't see anyone who looked like me working in TV news. Um, I thought there was a moment where I thought, you know, maybe I'll go into radio because then it doesn't matter what I look like, you know? Yeah. Um, but my mom, again, was the one who kind of encouraged me, like, don't change your dreams. Don't change your goals. Um, you know, this is something that obviously you're really good at. You were made for. Um, so go for it. Right. And, and just because it hasn't been done before, doesn't mean you can't be the first. Yeah. People always tell me I have a face for radio and I'm starting to believe them. <laughs> <laughs> That's not they're like, they're like that kid over there, he has a face for radio. And if you're young, you're like, Oh my God, that's the biggest compliment in the world. Then when you get older, you're like, hold on a second. <laughs> hey, wait a Why minute. That? Yeah. Yeah. What are you actually saying? But I, I do like your point there because yeah, it's when you look at the world now, I mean, there's so many platforms and for you, uh, hopefully this comes more of across as a com or, or a compliment, but it's like now there are probably kids out there that are looking at you and saying, well, if she's doing it, why can't I? And that don't necessarily mean they want to do it in the TV. They could do radio or they could be saying, well, it's Canada. It's like she's doing something on TV. Why can't I be like the first dancer with a, like a hijab or whatever their goal is? Um, Absolutely. And that is a big part of you know, what keeps me motivated and what keeps me going, because this is a hard industry to be in. It's not yeah. easy. Um, but when I do get messages from people saying exactly that, I had a girl who dressed up as me for Halloween. <laughs> and that was really crazy last year. Um, and so, you know, seeing that people saying, you know, now I think about this as a possible career goal for me, or as you say, think about going into an industry where I have never seen someone who looks like me, but I shouldn't stop myself from doing it just because it's never been done before. So that is something that really keeps me motivated, especially on the hard days. Now, I want to ask you like a little bit of a difficult question here as well. But like, you know, when you were starting in journalism in broadcasting and like you were doing your Rogers internships, your news 1010, um, like were there people inside that? And again, we're not naming names here, but it's like, were there people inside that that were probably like, hey, like, you know, you could go farther if you just remove the hijab or like, it's you know, so if you presented yourself this way. It's so interesting because I never really had anyone say that to my face. And, you know, and in some ways I feel really lucky because then it made me feel like the only person standing in my way is me. Right. Um, you know, the interesting thing about Canada is that we're very polite with our racism. <laughs> and so, you know, people don't didn't make overt comments to me or said, you'll never make it in this industry or uh, no one's going to hire you or whatever. Um, but I do know that those conversations were had. I found out years later um, from one of my classmates uh, that I had a professor who had approached a friend of mine and said, you know, 
Janelle is really good, but uh, I worry that she's, you know, going to have a hard time in this industry wearing hijab. You know, would you talk to her and ask her, would she ever consider removing it? And it's so interesting. She didn't feel like she could have that conversation with me because she knew she could get in trouble for that, right? That's discrimination, essentially. Yeah. Um, and same for a hiring manager. A hiring manager could never say that to me, but that doesn't mean that, that, that I wasn't passed over for a job because of it. And my friend at the time, you know, she was horrified that the teacher was asking her this and was like, no, like, I'm not going to ask her that. That's ridiculous. And didn't tell me about it until I had already like five years later when I was working in news as a broadcaster. And she said, hey, I just wanted to let you know, like, I actually had this conversation with our professor and I'm so glad that I didn't like tell you about it back yeah. then because I don't wouldn't want anything to kind of get in your way or get in your head about what you could or couldn't do. And so that was really interesting to me. I'd had other, I'd had a producer when I was working as a producer and I wasn't on air yet. I was um, working behind the scenes who just kind of in passing made a comment. Um, I was talking about a friend of mine who was Muslim and who was a reporter. And he said, oh, does she wear a hijab? And I said, no. And he said, oh yeah, they'd never put a woman in hijab on TV. It's too distracting. And he said it so flippantly, not knowing that this was something that I was like <laughs> trying to strive yeah. for. Um, but, you know, that was a moment in my head where I was like, we'll see. And hopefully I'll prove him wrong. Right? Yeah. So I feel really lucky that I didn't deal with a lot of overt kind of discrimination. Um, but, you know, I often had to be the one to address the elephant in the room when I was, you know, going for a job interview and, and say, listen, I get that this is going to be different and new. And maybe you have some apprehensions or some concerns or questions that you're afraid to ask. Like, let's talk about it. Let's hash it out. Let's get it out there. Um, and I think that helped a little bit. Yeah, because I feel like in a similar situation to yours, like I feel like when I go apply for jobs or internships, it's like I'll put down I'm a person with a disability. But it's because they don't see the disability. It's like, so, you know, it's Sturge Weber syndrome. It causes like seizures, whatever. But like, because it's not obvious, it's like, okay, what do we do with him? Like if we mm -hmm. put him in a hiring pool or if we hire him, like what's or the there's limitations? There's an assumption too about yeah. what your limitations might be, exactly. right? Yeah. And, and because there's fear about mm -hmm. talking about it, they may just say, this is too much to deal with. So we're just going to go with someone else rather than saying, how can we mitigate this or what are the things that we need to understand and how can we make sure that this is an environment that you can thrive in? Right. Because often it yeah. just requires a little bit of conversation um, yeah. and, and understanding. And, but the problem is people get scared to ask. They're afraid to offend. But I think that assumptions are more dangerous than, than having they're, an awful conversation. Yeah, they're, they're worse. It's almost like if you go into a place and it's like, oh, well, I don't want to ask him about that. It's like, well, he, he mentioned it. It's like, yeah, it's just easier just to let him go. It's like, okay, but if you had to ask me and let me explain it, then you were probably like, oh my God, okay, woo, we didn't have to yeah. do that much. It's like, yeah, okay. So, um, but I, I do think it's interesting because like you were saying is we're not, they're not openly about it. It's a closed door, but I, I would think because from someone who's, I haven't had anyone face to face tell me these, but like if, you know, someone had come to me later in, li later in life and be like, you know, you didn't get this because they were afraid of this. I'd be like, yeah, I would think I would be a little bit rattled. And then I think like the whole, my whole landscape would be like, all right, we'll change careers because clearly this isn't working. But I, I appreciate the fact she tells you after the fact. Yeah, <laughs> not yeah. Not, I mean, yeah. I think that it helped that I was in a secure place where it's like, obviously she was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so it made it easier to brush it off. But you're right. If it had been something that had been brought to me when I was still very early in my career, who knows that how yeah. much that could have affected me and impacted me from even trying to pursue this. Yeah, I can imagine like one day, like you're at Seneca or something doing like a hit. And then next minute someone's like, uh what happened to the hijab you're like uh it just decided not to wear today it's like did someone say something to you no i was just going for a new look it's like yeah no someone definitely said something and you know what the reality is especially as a woman in tv like forget muslim but like yeah. as a woman in tv there is so much conversation about your appearance how you look your hair your makeup your nails and like people think that that is a part of the conversation uh, that goes along with your skills. Um, and that's also really frustrating. I, you know, for, for the men who work in the, in the industry, yeah. it's not something they have to worry about. But for women, we have to also think about, you know, our appearance and how we present ourselves because that's another, you know, part of the puzzle when they're deciding who gets the job and who doesn't, that they're evaluating. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of frustrating too.
I think it's funny because we had actually Jennifer Hedger on like almost a year. Like I think it was like last uh, January. And she was saying like, you know, at TSN, there's a lot more females than males. But she said it's interesting. She likes working with males because like if you have a disagreement or something on set, it's like, okay, well, we had that disagreement. We go live. We do the show. It's over. And then she was like with females, it's almost like the little bit of a cattiness to it of almost like, okay, well, you know, we There's still didn't solve. Yeah, it's like we didn't. <laughs> we didn't. We still didn't solve the issue here. Where males like, all right, like, geez, okay, we said that like five minutes ago. You're still holding that against us. Okay, whatever. Um, but I just I haven't had that experience. I'm really yeah. lucky that I yeah. work with <laughs> a lot of, um, you know, really great women who are, uh, you know, we support each other. And I think that that's the important thing, right? Is a lot of times society pits women against each other, right? Yeah. And um, and makes you feel like you have to be in competition. There's only room for one of you, right? And yeah. so um, I think that the more we try to get away from that and, and try to encourage and lift each other up as women, I think that's really important because they're going to try to do it to us. So we shouldn't yeah. do it to ourselves. Yeah. I never actually thought of it that way, but like now that you mentioned it, I'm sure there's a few times when you go on like Instagram or something, it's like, who's the better female host? And you're like, well, they're both on different platforms. Why does this matter? We all, we all have something <laughs> different to offer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to ask like now um, in doing your new show, what are some things that you really like about it or things that you're thinking like, all right, like if, if from an outside point of view, let's put it this way. If you were trying to compel me to watch the show and you're basically saying, I've seen the promos, but I'm like, okay, I'm not sold. What are some things that you could sell me on the show to make me watch it? For me, I really love hearing from, from the people at the heart of the story. So the people who are directly impacted, um, you know, so I, for me, I try to focus less on, you know, the experts and the, the political pundits and the analysts. I want to hear from real people who are experiencing something about how something is impacting them um, and hearing their stories. So that's something that we really try to do a lot of. We also try as much as we can to do stories that maybe aren't making the headlines or maybe aren't at the top of the news agenda. You know, that was something that we tried to do, especially around the election. Um, you know, what are the what are the topics that aren't being talked about in the debate? What are the topics that none of the leaders are mentioning? But, you know, there as we you know, we talked about people with disabilities and, you know, yeah. what they're looking for in this election. And we haven't heard any of the po political leaders talk about that, um, you know, uh, um, even this year with what's happening with the residential schools. And we thought there would be so much more conversation about indigenous issues and it wasn't really. And so, you know, giving an opportunity for folks to have that platform, um, even when it's not at the top of the news cycle or not in, in the agenda, how do we kind of think about what's being missed? What aren't we hearing? Who aren't we hearing from? And trying to bring those voices to the table. Is it is it kind of like safe to say, not like trying to label it, but is it kind of a safe to say it's kind of like, a voice for maybe the voiceless or a voice for a little bit of like diversity and disability in a sense. Cause I know. Yeah. I've seen a few, I mean, we do, yeah. we do try to bring in marginalized voices and uh, you know, there's a say, there's a, a saying from an author who says there's no such thing as the voiceless, only the deliberately silenced. Right. Um, and, and that's the idea that we, we have an opportunity. We have a platform to hear from these people. We can go to these communities. We can reach out to them. We just choose not to. Right. So how do we use these platforms? And we talk about it being Canada tonight. That's all of Canada. Right. Yeah, yeah, Often yeah. not all of Canada gets heard from. And that includes even, you know, a, a geographical diversity, uh, you know, doing stories in different places, often because newsrooms are set in big cities, you know, Toronto, Vancouver. Um, that tends to be those tends to be the stories that we focus on, because that's what the people who are making decisions about it are interested in, are impacted on. So how do we tap into the other communities that don't have as much access to the newsroom and, and make sure we're talking about issues that are impacting them because they are Canadians as well? Yeah, I, I want to ask this, and this is going to probably be the equivalent of when someone says, when I say I'm a Newfoundlander, and they're like, oh, do you know Joe from Newfoundland? So, <laughs> you know, at least I made the joke here. But like, you know, I, I've interviewed Hannah Ryan Singh, and now he obviously has like the turban, uh, a part of his kind of comfort zone, I guess, and part of his background. Uh, but I thought it was really interesting when his response was when we asked him, like, there are people, I guess, out West in Calgary that will come up to him and be like, you know, you're an inspiration because I see you do Calgary Flames games and they believe that now they can make, you know, the same platform as him. Um, it's kind of maybe a two-parter. Like, have you ever had these kind of conversations with Hannah Ryan saying, have you ever met him? 
And if, if I've never oh, met him, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> well then, yeah. I've never met him. Um, never talked to him. Um, but it's really cool to see other people who also have never had an opportunity to have a platform like this. And I want to see more of it. Whether it's you know Muslims, as you say, people with disabilities. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many different uh, demographics that aren't represented in mainstream media that are left out. And and I want to see more of that. Um, you know, it's really great and exciting to be the first, but I don't want to be the only and I don't want to be the last. And, you know, I have uh, there are at least two other women in hijab who work in news in different uh, news stations in Canada, which is really exciting for me. Also, because, you know, I can't be everything for everyone. In the you sense can't? That, <laughs> what? In the no. sense that, you know, I'm, you know, yes, I'm Muslim, but, you know, I also have a very different experience than lots of Muslims in Canada. Do we have, you know, Muslims have so many different languages and socioeconomic backgrounds and uh, you know, interest in different things. So for me, you know, I can't represent the 1 million yeah. Muslims across Canada, just like you can't represent every person with disability. Uh, your experiences are also different. So we need to see a broad range of them, uh, of people from, from these different backgrounds uh, represented because we're all going to bring different perspectives. No, that's fair. I, I just, let me make a note. Janela says I can't represent everyone. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I mean, imagine if someone was just like, you didn't know that already. I'm like, uh, no, I, I just kind of well, clued in. No. Or this <laughs> idea that like, okay, let me get the, the disability perspective. I'm going to ask Tobin. Oh, absolutely. Now, yeah, well, no, I asked right. Tobin and Tobin told me this, right? Yeah, yeah. And so. Because I would know it all. Like, like, right, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so this idea that like you are the representative or you are the spokesperson for yeah. this one group that you happen to, you know, relate to. Yeah. Um, um, but you know, and then they feel like, oh, they checked the box. Well, I asked Tobin, and Tobin oh, yeah. told Tobin told me this, so that must that's it. I'm yeah. done, right? We have we have a meeting once a year to figure out who our new leader is. And this year, <laughs> exactly. This, this year it was me. Next year you it was someone. I'm like, hold on, hold on. But I represented Sturge Weber, and they're like, yeah, but you didn't represent Dave over there in a wheelchair. So we got this is Dave's time. I'd be like, oh my god. But yeah, no, that's fair. I guess I'll go back to the school side first. But with the school side, when you were doing uh, communications and with journalism, like. What I know you mentioned earlier that there was a teacher that kind of said, okay, like I'm worried about this, but like, were you comfortable all the time wearing it like right from day one or was it something that you kind of adapted into? Yeah, I've worn hijab most of my life. I started wearing hijab in elementary school. And and actually, you know, when I started wearing it, I was probably too young to be wearing it, but my mom yeah. and my sister were, and I wanted to be like them. And my mom was like, she didn't want me to wear it. She, and I was very stubborn. Um, so she's like, all right, you know, do you? And she let me be. So, you know, growing up in Toronto, it's a very multicultural and diverse city. And, and so I didn't really feel like an outsider or an other because it wasn't uncommon to see not just Muslims, but people from lots of different backgrounds and lots of different places. And that was usual. Um, I will say, you know, after 9-11, I was in high school when 9-11 happened. And um, my mom was really scared for me and my sister. Um, and she actually asked us, you know, do you want to remove it? And we were both like, no, like we, you know, we won't be, you know, um, kind of fearful. We shouldn't live in fear, right? We should be able to be who we are. We haven't done anything wrong and yeah. we shouldn't be afraid and, and we should be proud of who we are. And, you know, we saw it as more like a moment of education as we talked about earlier, right? Ignorance and assumption. And I was always happy when people would ask me questions because they gave me an opportunity to actually inform them other than just let them kind of go on in their, in their ignorance. So um, for me, yeah, I, I, you know, I've always kind of felt pretty comfortable in my in my skin and my hijab. What was challenging for me was when I first went into a newsroom and coming from a very diverse and multicultural city like Toronto, I was shocked when I went into my first newsroom in Toronto in the biggest local newsroom in the country. And it was not diverse. It did not look like Toronto. That was when I first felt like an outsider. Yeah. Um, I did feel very different. I stuck out because there wasn't a lot of people of color in the newsroom, let alone, you know, a woman in hijab. And so um, that was a, a challenge. But again, kind of for me, it was an opportunity to engage in conversations with people, uh, you know, about me and who I am. And at the end of the day, they would realize like, oh, she's not very different. Like she's still yeah. very Canadian. And yeah. to me, I don't see those identities at odds with each other. I feel like very similar to what you said there when, cause I remember when I did my internship with like, I, it was global Toronto and I'm coming from Newfoundland. And like, I think it's almost kind of count. Not, not, 
to go against what you said, but it's like, I went up there and I'm like, okay, so I see like, um, there was like people with Mexican heritage. There was people with like Italian and like they're representing. And then they'd be like pitching stories of like, why don't we do this in the Italian community? I'm like, and I'd be like looking there like beady eyes, like, all right, like, how are you going to, how are you going to tell him? No, like, tell me how you're going to tell him. No, like, and then they'd be like, Oh, we, we can, we can discuss that. And I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. And then it'd be like the Newfoundlander pitches an idea. It's like, I don't know nothing about Toronto. It's like, can I do a leaf story? And they're, like, they're like, they're like, can you say that again, but less fast? I'm like, okay. I'm like, can I do a leaf story? And they're like, okay, easy. Don't get tone with us. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to work here. It's like, it's like, it's either I'm too fast or too, like, or you're, you're saying I don't like even just enough. your accent was something that was foreign and difficult for them to understand. Yeah. You can, you, I mean, I don't like for me, I think of the first year at Carlton, I would always ask people, what are you at? And they'd be like, come again. And I'd be like, oh, they probably didn't hear me. What are you at? And then they'd be like, what, what do you mean? What does that mean? Yeah. I'm like, oh, it just means what's up. And they're like, why don't you say that? I'm like, it wouldn't <laughs> click in. Cause I was kind of like stubborn with you with the hijab. I was kind of like, no, I, I know what I'm saying. Say, yeah. And then they're like, it would take a five minute conversation to get like two words out. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to ask you, Hey, what's up? And they're like, Hey, you're from Newfoundland. I don't know the accent. I'm like, I can't win. <laughs> um, I want to ask a little bit of the fun aspect here, but like um, with the musical side of things, like I I'm a big fan of music. Uh, I, I feel like if someone's like, oh, I'm not a fan of music, you'd be like, okay. Uh, but like, who are some people that you probably have on your like playlist right now that e either before you do a new story or like, you know, while you're having a bad day, you just turn them on. You're like, this gets me through it. I'm, I'm stuck in the 2000s. Um, That's fair. So, Same here. Yeah. <laughs> My husband makes fun of me because he says I don't listen to any new music. Like he's always on the like what's new or what's trending on Spotify. And it like gives him suggestions. Okay. I'm like, I don't like listening to anything new. I like what I know all the words to. And, <laughs> and so, you know, I was really into like R&B, hip hop, you know, in the 2000s, you know, um, obviously, you know, was in middle school into all the boy bands and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> um, yeah, so that's kind of what, what's uh, what's on my shuffle playlist. <laughs> that, a lot that's, of Beyonce, a lot of, you know, uh, that era. That's fair. I mean, I have a, a niece that sleeps over at times and she likes listening to iHeart 2000s and then will <laughs> accuse me of like, why are you not letting them sing? I'm like, because I grew up with this. <laughs> Um, the worst asked, though is that when you know you start to see those anniversaries is like this song is 20 years old or like don't. um <laughs> it's considered like uh old school music and i'm like excuse me yeah well there's a guy like i'm not big on tiktok but there's a guy on tiktok that like broke it down the other day where it's like your tv shows are now throwbacks and then it's yeah. like your thing and i'm just like so hold on you're telling me fresh fresh year or like yeah. uh, fresh prince, fresh of prince of Bel -Air. Bel -Air. And, and i'm like no i'm not accepting that and then when they had the whole friends reunion, I sat there watching it. And then I was like, no, this is ancient don't. history. Toby. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> they, they even said like, I remember this was years ago, but it's like, they even said like, uh, they're like, yeah, kids born September, 2001 are now teenagers. And oh plus God. kids now that's like, are that age or post, they have not experienced nine 11 and they're learning about it in the history books. So I'm like, I'm a little bit concerned of how the history book portrays that, but sure. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's just, crazy to think that yeah. things that we've gone through in our lifetime are considered history now. <laughs> no, no, that's fair. Uh, for the last question, because I know we're around the 28 minute mark here and I want to make sure that you get out, get your new story done, because I don't want you to come on like Canada. We're and all like, about like, the headlines, Toby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, listen, I was on Toby tonight. I didn't get through everything. And then it's like local Newfoundlander gets in trouble. It's like um, the last thing I want to ask is like, you know, for people out there that uh, whether they have a disability, whether they're just trying to make it in the media, whether they're someone like yourself. What's some kind of insight or maybe inspirational, I don't know, a uh, quote that you can give them to be like, hey, keep going. Or maybe you could just be like, hey, I'm the only one here. Don't come near me. <laughs> no, no, not at all. There's room for all of us. I definitely fight a lot of imposter syndrome. I definitely have those moments where I feel like, oh, my God, you know, how did I even get here? You know, they're going to find me out. They're going to realize that I, you know, I am not as smart as I, you know, appear to be or I'm not as good as they thought I was. And honestly, I fake it a lot. <laughs> I fake confidence a lot. And that helps me get through it. And so my motto is all, has been for a long time is fake it till you make it um, in the sense that like you have to show people that you think you deserve to be here. And that 
you know, will give them the confidence um, to see that you deserve to be here. I think if you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. And so for me, at least if I don't believe in myself, I at least pretend that I do. <laughs> and, and I fake it a lot. So so yeah, that and, and a lot of persistence. Don't take no for an answer. I mean, Tobin, that's how you got this interview, right? Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> you know that well. Yeah, it's it's fair. Backstory is I used to, I, I went to Janelle's house, knocked on the door, and she's like, please leave me alone. And I'm just like, one interview, one interview, please. And she's How like, one interview and I leave. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Janella Massa for coming on to the show. Remember, you can get past episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying thank you for listening and good night.